Thank you. We now have topical questions. Question one, Richard Simpson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to ensure the concerns of 56 doctors at the Beetson Cancer Centre regarding patient safety are fully addressed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Okay, um, well, let me firstly be absolutely clear that patient safety is of paramount concern. Um, whilst it's a, a very complex issue about a very highly specialised unit and its support services, there is no question that the views of clinicians including those at the Beetson, are extremely important and need to be fully addressed. I've spoken to the chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and have been assured this will happen. The chief medical officer has had uh, constructive discussions with the chair of the local consultants committee and the health board's medical director about the need for all parties to commit to resolving these concerns. It's vital that the Health Board addresses the issues raised so that the move can go ahead with the support of clinicians and a meeting is planned for tomorrow to continue to take this forward. In the meantime, I've been assured by the Health Board that key support services such as 24-7 anaesthetic cover will be maintained until an agreed sustainable solution is in place. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that reply and I particularly welcome the emphasis on patient safety. The fact that these 56 consultants warned that services for seriously ill patients requiring a high dependency unit were not going to be safe is surely worrying, and that they felt the need to go public to fulfil their obligations based on the General Medical Council guidance after Mid-Staffordshire is surely an indictment of the Board's approach. Why did we reach this point where doctors who do not go public lightly and the Board, having had four years to consult on the effect on services at hospitals like the Beechton of opening of the Southern General Hospital uh, it, it did not appear to have occurred. Why, why were they not properly consulted beforehand? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, can I say to, to Richard Simpson that um, there have, of course, been a number of discussions over a long period of time. The issue, of course, is that there was a, a failure to agree on some of the detailed changes. Um, and Richard Simpson is right. I think. Um, I absolutely would have preferred all of these issues to have been resolved in a different manner, but what's important is that they are now resolved uh, going forward. Of course, um, the General Medical Council's role is, is in the regulation of doctors. It is Healthcare Improvement Scotland that is uh, the organisation tasked to look uh, into issues of patient safety. And uh, as I understand, they are now going to uh, look into the issues of concern raised and make an assessment. But what is critical, uh, firstly, at tomorrow's meeting, there is a, an interim set of arrangements agreed beyond the moves that have already been made around anaesthetic cover that are to the satisfaction of the clinicians and the board moving forward in order to create the space to agree some of the more difficult issues to make sure there's a sustainable service going forward. But I am in, in exactly the same place as Richard Simpson. These issues have to be resolved. The clinicians have to be assured. Patient safety is paramount above all else in this matter. Mr Simpson. Thank you. Um, in the response that we've seen in the public domain, and the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary has referred to it, the Greater Glasgow Board have said they'll provide resident and therefore presumably junior anaesthetics on site overnight and a consultant on call during the 24 hour period. Uh, I just have, I have personal reservations about that, but my views are irrelevant. Um, the, obviously, it is a matter for the consultants to agree on this uh, and, and assure themselves that the service will be adequate and safe. But speaking of adequacy, is the Minister comfortable with the reports in the press uh, today of mayhem at the Southern General Hospital Accident and Emergency Unit with eight-hour waits, trolleys lining corridors, sick patients having to sit on the floor, diversion to the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, ambulances waiting two hours to discharge into A&E? I wonder just where the modelling was for the transition, because even if these are teasing problems, they affect real individuals. And I just wonder what modelling was done and whether the Cabinet Secretary will agree to have a very close look at this in case we actually have other hospitals opening in future where there is a transfer of services. And finally, Cabinet uh, Presiding Officer, the closure of Western General Accident and Emergency is going to occur at the end of the month. If we've already got chaos with the current transfer, then can I suggest to her that the officials need to look very closely at postponing that transfer in order not to create more chaos? Well, 
I think Richard Simpson's in danger of conflating two very serious issues, but nonetheless two different issues. So let's finish on the issue of the beats. And first of all, it is absolutely critical, as I said earlier on, that clinicians are satisfied with matters going forward. That's why the proposal to continue 24-7 anaesthetic cover has been um, agreed with clinicians going forward. But there are other remaining issues that need to be resolved. The meeting tomorrow night is very important as part of that. And where I expect everyone to get to is to an agreeable set of arrangements that will provide um, a, an interim solution while some of the further discussions take place about the ongoing permanent sustainable solution uh, for the Beetson. Um, Richard Simpson then went on to talk about the new South Glasgow University Hospital. Now, there were, of course, uh, last week, a very major transfer from the Victoria to the new hospital. Um, that involved a transfer of patients, a transfer of staff, and that is a very complicated, uh, difficult transfer to make. Um, and yes, there were issues emerging that uh, uh, made uh, it very challenging around the availability of, of beds and staff, and there were some pressure points at the end of last week. What I can tell him, though, as of yesterday, the hospital was performing very well, and A&E was performing very well, with, I think, it was around a 91% achievement of the four-hour target and patients flowing through the system. He mentioned the Western. The Western begins to move across this weekend, and they are absolutely looking at the lessons learned from the Victoria and making sure that um, issues of pressure that emerged are addressed in the way that they move the Western. But I don't think there would be anything to be gained from not sticking to the timetable of transfer so that we can get all of these services transferred across the the staff can get working uh, in their new uh, environment and that patients uh, can be settled into their new environment as well. So I would hope that Richard Simpson, despite some of the, the, the challenges that have come with the transfer, would re also recognise that what we have is a first-class, world-class hospital um, that I hope he will take the, the opportunity to visit at some point and will hopefully be as impressed as I was. And of course, I am on a daily basis uh, being kept in touch with the detail of what is happening at the front door of the hospital and to make sure that any issues that are emerging that we're alerted to, but more importantly, they are uh, addressed. A big move like this does bring with it some challenges, but I hope we'll have Richard Simpson's support as we work through those challenges over the next few days and weeks. Lynette Mill. Thank you. Um, clearly, uh, the concerns of the, the Beetson clinicians have to be taken very seriously. And as Richard Simpson said, it takes a lot for clinicians to actually go public as they have done. Were any of their concerns actually raised via the National Confidential NHS Alert Line? Um, and I'm interested to know that. And it, given that that line has now been in place for two years, what assessment has been made of its effectiveness? And uh, I understand there's a review of it taking place. When will that be published? Well, can I say to Nanette Milne, I will get back to her about whether or not any issues have been raised. Of course, you it wouldn't be as specific as to say a particular clinician from a particular location raised this particular issue. It's not quite as specific as that, but I will get back to her on the general point uh, around the uh, alert line. But in this issue, what has been Definitely the case is that there has been an ongoing dialogue with clinicians and the board. It's not that the board weren't speaking to clinicians. It's just that uh, there was a failure to agree on certain aspects of, uh, of what the way forward was. And the clinicians have a strongly held view around certain aspects of um, the arrangements going forward that they did not agree with the board on. And those issues must be resolved. They have to be resolved, not just to the satisfaction of the clinicians, but I think to the satisfaction of us all that patient safety is paramount and we will absolutely take no risk. But I'm confident that through those ongoing negotiations, the meeting tomorrow is an important part, the involvement of the chief medical officer, that we will get to a place where the clinicians are satisfied um, and the, the board have a sustainable model uh, to take forward the very excellent world-class service that they have at the Beats and the one that we should all be proud of. Question two, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions have taken place between the Scottish Government and the UK Government on the subject of HS2. Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown. I discussed the weekend newspaper reports about the HS2 Limited study with Sir David Higgins, the chair of HS2 Limited, this morning. 
Uh, I've written to the Secretary of State for Transport, Patrick McLaughlin, on several occasions, including three times subsequent to his statement to the Conservative Party conference in favour of three-hour journey times between Scotland and London. I've made clear to Mr McLaughlin that the Scottish Government's position, indeed the position of, I think, all of the parties in this chamber, is that high-speed rail must come to Scotland. Despite these challenges at a ministerial level, my officials are in contact with their UK government counterparts and indeed with HS2 Limited. Transport Scotland officials sat on the steering group for HS2 Limited study into broad options for extending HS2 to Scotland. The study's advice has been with the UK and Scottish ministers since December, but despite, as I say, several requests for a meeting with the Secretary of State for Transport, I have had no positive response. Indeed, he has not managed to meet with me since he was appointed in September 2012. Right, Mackenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if he agrees with me that including Scotland in HS2 would deliver significant economic benefits by improving connectivity and removing barriers for everybody in Scotland, but particularly for businesses in the more remote parts of the country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do agree with that, as does uh, Civic Scotland, in particular the business community that uh, Mike McKenzie refers to, but also our councils, trade unions and many others. Those significant economic benefits would accrue at both ends of high-speed rail and at all points in between. There would also be far greater environmental benefits from modal shift if we can achieve the two-and-a-half to three-hour journey times between Scotland and London that HSR can bring. And that's in addition to the already required additional freight capacity, which will help in terms of the environment and in terms of productivity. Mr McKenzie. Thank the Minister again. And in view of his uh, answer to my initial question, does he agree that the UK Government has shown a lack of ambition and insufficient consideration for Scotland throughout the development of the plans for HS2? Cabinet Secretary. I do agree. I think the UK Government has been unambitious and has been disrespectful in terms of a complete lack of dialogue uh, and the leaking of its reports, reports which they asked us to respect the, the confidentiality of, and in relation to high-speed rail coming to Scotland. And I would, for my part, encourage all parties and interest groups to join with me in demanding that the Secretary of State for Transport starts to discuss how we can bring HSR to Scotland as quickly as possible. And it's also worth saying, of course, if it was to be the case that high-speed rail went to the north of England but not to Scotland, that is the worst of all worlds for Scotland. That would put us at a substantial disadvantage. I think there is substantial unity uh, on this issue across Scotland in terms of the political parties and Civic Scotland. And I think uh, the UK government would be ill-advised to ignore that unity. Alex Johnson. The Minister will be aware that one of the dimensions of the development of high-speed rail in, in recent months has been the discussion taking place between cities in the north of England to see how they can steer that development. Can the Minister tell me if the Scottish Government has had any contact with the organisation formed by these north of England cities, or has uh, he facilitated any contact between Scotland's major cities and these north of England cities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, there has been such contact between the cities in the north of England. I've spoken at conferences. I think the last one was in Manchester, where the leaders of various cities of the north of England uh, 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 gathered together to talk about high-speed rail and its implications. And also, I think my predecessor, Alec Neil, also had particular discussions with some of the cities affected. Of course, the, some of the proposals for high-speed rail are not actually high-speed rail. The ones that they're talking about traversing the north of England, they are a higher speed rail, but not high-speed rail. But we think, for the reasons that I've outlined already, that if we can get high-speed rail to Scotland, to Edinburgh and Glasgow, then the points in between Manchester, Leeds and Scotland could all benefit from high-speed rail. And that's what we'd urge uh, everybody in this chamber, including those Conservative members who may have some sway with the Conservative government, to get behind that and get the Transport Secretary to come and speak to people in Scotland so we can progress this issue. Question three, Alice McInnes. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that Police Scotland has been using facial recognition technology on images stored in the Police National Database. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Police Scotland retain images to prevent and detect crime. Uh, Police Scotland has provided assurance that photographs are only taken when a suspect is detained, arrested and or charged. Uh, the service does not retain images indefinitely of people who were not subsequently charged or convicted of an offence. The images are retained on the criminal history system and uploaded to the Police National Database, which was created by and is administered by the Home Office. 
The facial recognition technology has been available to Police Scotland on the Police National Database since 2014 and has been used on 440 occasions. The Police National Database is an extremely valuable resource which helps to prevent and detect crime to make communities safer across Scotland. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Of course, this technology has the potential to help detect crime, but like other biometric uh, technologies, its use must be properly regulated. Yet this has been put into operation without any public or parliamentary scrutiny. The Biometrics Commissioner uh, has warned about the dangers involved in creating this database, as it is subject to none of the controls and protections which currently apply as regards to DNA or fingerprint databases. Does the Cabinet Secretary share the concerns of the expert independent biometrics commissioner? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's also important that we take into account any concerns which are raised on these matters, but the member will also be aware uh, that within uh, Scotland we have the Criminal Justice Licensing Scotland Act that provides provision around the retention of information on the criminal history system which Police Scotland operate and which subsequently feeds into the Police nat National Database. So it would be wrong to suggest that there is no provision around how records are held on individuals who are charged or convicted of offences. But as ever, uh, sign officer, we are always prepared to look at areas where improvements can be made. But I'm not aware of any particular concerns that have been identified in the way in which Police Scotland are operating the system that is presently administered by the Home Office. Ms McInnes. Thank you for that. I mean, it's important not, not to be complacent about this. We don't have a clear regulatory framework and proper safeguards. Can I ask what is in place at the moment to prevent the police using the technology to go on fishing trips, uh, to stop them embarking on mass surveillance? Could they identify individuals, for example, at football games? Um, from that. And secondly, um, the technology hasn't yet been rigorously tested. What safeguards, if any, are in place to prevent wrongful mistaken identification? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senator Officer, as I outlined in my earlier response, um, the way in which Police Scotland operate the uh, photographic recognition, facial recognition system, is that photographs are only taken of an individual uh, if they are detained, arrested and or charged. They do not retain uh, images indefinitely of people who have not been subsequently charged or convicted of a crime. So if the person is not charged, if they are dealt with by a disposal which is not a prosecution or they are found not guilty, the criminal history system which Police Scotland operate is updated to recognise that, which then has the weeding out of those files and that subsequently updates the Police National Database, which means that any information that is put onto that is removed from the system as it stands. So there is a weeding mechanism to, in the system in order to remove those individuals who have not been subsequently charged or convicted of an offence. And that ensures that those images are not then retained on the Police National Database. Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you know whether or not the Scottish Police Authority agreed to Police Scotland uploading uh, custody photographs to the Police National Database? Were they aware? Was there agreement sought, and if it wasn't, is this just like deployment of armed police, stop search? Are, are the SPA doing their job here? And if they're not, can you have a word with them, try and get them to take some control over what Police Scotland is getting up to? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think, President Officer, it's important we keep a level of uh, uh, perspective. You know, perspective around these matters. And trying to wrap this up into armed police officers and stop and search Again, it is blowing it all out of proportion, to be perfectly frank. Look, I, I believe that there are areas where uh, the Scottish uh, Police Authority can improve uh, the way in which they're operating. The Chief Inspector of Constabulary has already looked at that. There's an action plan in place in order to improve these areas as well. Uh, so I think it's important that we recognise that um, although there will be issues that... Uh, that have to be addressed at various times and how policing is taken forward and how the Scottish Police Authority are operating. I think to try and just roll this all into everything is just bad doesn't help anyone and doesn't take any of these issues forward in a reasonable and considered way. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 13246.